Hello. Today we continue our conversation with Gleb Vladimirovich Nosovsky about the events of Russian history in the 18th century, which we started in the previous video. The Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology provides a visual introduction to this topic. In the exposition, The Defeat of Moscow Tartary, it is explained that the events of the late 18th century, known in history as the War with Pugachev, were actually a military confrontation between the Russian Empire of the Romanovs and the largest state at that time, Moscow Tartary. The exposition presents a complete picture of the events from the background of the conflict to the final defeat of Tartary. The hall also houses separate modules that tell the story of the creators of the Romanov version of Russian history and their main opponent, the great Russian scientist Mikhail Vasilyevich Lomonosov. Gleb Vladimirovich, hello. Hello. It's nice to meet again. Gleb Vladimirovich, in your book, Pugachev and Suvorov, The Secret of Siberian American History, you specifically mention that the grandson of the real Peter the Great did not die in his youth, but ended up in western Siberia in the town of Berezov together with Alexander Menshikov. For Menshikov, it was not an exile, as is commonly believed, but a flight to the territory of another state. However, according to traditional history, at that time Siberia belonged to the Romanovs. Here I am showing a page from an English encyclopedia from the 1770s, even before the war with Pugachev. This encyclopedia lists various countries. This is the geographical section of the encyclopedia. Number 9 is Russia. Here is its area, its capital, and the coordinates of the capital. The area is 1,103,485 square miles, and the capital is St. Petersburg. Now let's look below. There is another state, Tartary, which is divided into three parts. Chinese Tartary with an area of 644,000 square miles and its capital in Xi'an. Independent Tartary with an area of 778,000 square miles and its capital in Samarkand. In Moscow Tartary, with an area of 3,050,000 square miles and its capital in Tobols. This state, Moscow Tartary, listed in the geographical section of the Encyclopedia Britannica, was the largest state in the world. There is no other state that is even larger than 2 million. All others are smaller than 2 million, but this one is 3 million square miles. This is the largest state in the world in the 18th century. Here it is shown in more detail. Here at the bottom is Tartary, Chinese, independent and Moscow with its capital in Tobols. If you look at the maps of the 18th century in the geographical section of the Encyclopedia Britannica, that's exactly what is depicted. Here is a French map, Great Tartary, a huge country. Here is another map, which is more detailed. It shows all three Tartaries, Moscow Tartary, the largest one. All together form Grand Tartary, Independent Tartary with its capital in Samarkand, Moscow Tartary with its capital in Tobols, and Chinese Tartary with its capital in Xi'an. Chinese Tartary is not China. Here is China, and there is Chinese Tartary which is a different country. And look, the border is drawn. Here is the border of this Tartary, which separates it from the Romanov's empire. 
империи государства Романовых. I will explain it in more detail now. By the way, this border is slightly different on various maps, and on the maps of the 18th century, you can notice how it moved. I will show you maps later, but let me say in advance that if you look at the maps of the 18th century, arrange them in chronological order and see how this border looked. You can see that initially Tabals was either on the edge or even on the Romanov side. And initially their capital was not in Tabals, it was somewhere else, possibly in Irkutsk, I don't know, but not in Tabals. In the 18th century, the Moscow Tartary begins its advance. It is precisely the Moscow Tartary that initiates the advance. And on later maps, this border starts shifting westward and they reclaimed Tabals and make it their capital. Tabals became the capital by the end of the 18th century, but before Pugachev. By the end of the 18th century, their capital was already in Tabals. They reclaimed Tabals and advance westward. In other words, they exert pressure on St. Petersburg and make progress towards it. A situation arises where Menshikov, most likely with the heir, since the heir disappeared, flees to Bereza. In other words, it is a neighboring state. After that, this state starts exerting pressure and advancing the border, initiating an offensive. This is a standard situation that often occurs in history when there are two neighboring states, and one is in turmoil. A certain dynasty is pushed away from the throne. Representatives of that dynasty survive, flee to a neighboring state, make agreements with the authorities of that state, and with the help of the troops of that neighboring state, they begin to reclaim their own state. In other words, they fight against their own state, against the new rulers of their state, with the aim of reclaiming the throne. Naturally, they make promises to their neighbors in return for their help. This is precisely the situation that arises in the 18th century after the disappearance of Peter II, who most likely ends up in Berezov, because Menshikov is in Berezov. And Berezov is a town of the Moscow Tartary. Here are a few more maps. Look, here is another map. This border between the Moscow Tartary is clearly visible here. It is drawn in red. Here is a Russian map from the 18th century as well. The Great Tartary is also marked here. Independent Tartary, Free Tartary. Do you see? Great Tartary, Free Tartary. Now we say Tartary, but in reality, it is more accurate to say Tataria because in the West, it was written as Tartary, but in Russian, Tataria is more correct. Great Tataria, Free Tataria, and Chinese Tataria, and China is different. And there is also a border. I will show it to you now. The border is indeed drawn as a dividing line between two states. Here it is shown prominently. You can see how the border between Great Tartary and the Romanov Russia is drawn. Look carefully. The Caspian Sea, the lower course of the Volga River, all of this is still in Tartary. Furthermore, these steppe lands near the Sea of Azov and part of Ukraine are most likely also in Tartary. It surrounds them, and Ukraine, to a significant extent, was also part of it. Ukraine did not submit to the Romanovs. Ukraine would be later annexed, specifically during Potemkin's time, and the attachment to the land would occur in Ukraine. We know that at that time, Ukraine did not have serfdom. While the rest of Russia had it, Ukraine did not. Looking at the border, it is evident that it does not reach the Azov Sea. There is a gap there. So, all of this was Tartary, with its own order, laws, and voivodes. The Romanovs already had governors, while Tartary still had voivodes. 
They had their own currency, their own money, but I will talk about that later. Moreover, these are not just lines and dots drawn on the map. Along these borders, remnants of fortified armed border lines still exist with cannons and redoubts. It's not just a cartographer's drawing. It exists on the ground. These are called the Siberian lines, and I will talk about them as well. Look where the border passes. Somewhere near Nizhny Novgorod. Below Nizhny Novgorod is already Tartary, with its capital in Tobols. It was a Russian state. Here is another map. Look at how clearly the border is drawn between Moscow Tartary, with its capital in Tobols, and the Romanov Russia. Here is another map where we marked the borders to make them clearly visible. This is what Moscow Tartary looks like. Free Tartary, Independent Tartary, and Chinese Tartary are apart from it and below this border. And this is Moscow Tartary with its capital in Tobols. This is what it looked like in the 18th century. See where the western border of Moscow Tartary crossed the Volga River, near Nizhny Novgorod. Slightly below or around Nizhny Novgorod. Here is a map from Blau's atlas. You can also see how clearly the border is drawn between the Romanov Russia and Moscow Tartary. Here it is. By the way, this is the Tobol Isham line that runs along this border. Here is the fortified line. Here are the redoubt and the ramparts. Their remnants still exist to this day. They were quite powerful defensive structures, and their remains can still be found on the ground. Local historians study them. This is an 18th century map. Here is a fragment. You can see the fortified line. On the next slide, I will show it in more detail. The new Siberian line. Here is Tobol's. Against who was this fortified line built? On the left side is the Romanov Russia. It put up such a fortified line, put guns. Against whom? We can see against whom. Tobol's is on the other side. Another map. Here is the fortified line against Moscow Tartary, against Tobol's. Here is the painting, Menshikov and Berezov. But this was painted by modern artists, suggesting that he sat alone in his hut in his expensive furs and lamented how far he had been exiled. Gleb Vladimirovich, during the war between Moscow Tartary and the Romanov Russia, the heir of Peter the Great, known as Peter Fyodorovich, was located on Tartary's territory. Who do you think this person was? They say Peter Fyodorovich. It could be Peter Fyodorovich or Peter Petrovich. It could either be Peter II himself, but more likely, his son or grandson. Peter II would have been that boy who remained alive after the death of the false Peter. By this time, Peter II would have been an old man. This was already the 1770s. Peter II would have been around 60 years old. Still, this person would have been younger. 
It could be either Peter II's son or grandson, either Peter Petrovich or perhaps indeed Peter Fyodorovich. The Romanovs were very clever at distorting history. They claimed that this was the same Peter Fyodorovich who was Catherine's husband and who was killed. Ignorant Cossacks rallied around the imposter Pugachev and elevated him as a symbol under the name Peter Fyodorovich. It's all a lie. Just like many other things the Romanovs invented in history. It's a lie. They lied from the very beginning when they came to power, and it's the same here. Look at Pugachev's seal. Does Pugachev resemble an ordinary Cossack on this seal? You see, he is wearing a wig or at least some curls and he is clean shaven. So, he was a person of European appearance. It's no coincidence that after this, Princess Tarakanova appears. It's a huge topic. Who is Princess Tarakanova? How difficult was for her to appear after Pugachev events in the West? She speaks Oriental languages. She is the Princess of Vladimir. Everyone accepts her as a representative of the Tsarist Russian dynasty. There was a whole affair, when Alexei Orlov, with great efforts and deception, brought her from Western Europe to St. Petersburg, where she was slain. That is, the remnants of this dynasty, which escaped to Moscow Tartary, reveal themselves. They are visible. By the way, here is another seal of the Pugachev military collegium. All documents from the time of Pugachev were destroyed. This is one of Pugachev's proclamations. It is written in Arabic script. It is considered to be in the Tatar language, but when I look at these letters, I see that it is most likely written in Persian, not Tatar. There are too few Alifs. It should be investigated. It means that it is written in a language used for diplomatic correspondence. This is a proclamation of the Pugachev's men. Here is a copy of the decree of our imperial majesty, the autocrat of all Russia. But this is a copy. It is already a Romanov's copy. It is another question whether they accurately transcribed it or not. There are no originals. Gleb Vladimirovich, why are there no originals? After all, it was already the late 18th century, when the document circulation in the state was at an appropriate level. It was indeed a secret. Even Pushkin was not allowed access to Pugachev's archives. It was a seven-seal secret. People who knew something about it were sought out and killed. In the Romanov Russia, there was an infamous secret chancellery, which, by the way, was abolished some time after the victory over Pugachev. What is the secret chancellery? The secret chancellery was an institution where people were brought if they were caught for something or for no reason at all. A person comes to the authorities and says, word and deed. It was a code phrase, word and deed. It means that they know something that they could only disclose to the secret chancellery and no one else. Any official of the Romanov Russia who heard the phrase, word and deed, from any person, whether a criminal or not, was obliged to escort that person, without touching them, to the secret chancellery. Only they could interrogate him and ask what he knew about a certain matter. Nobody knew which matter it was. It was concealed. And why was such an institution needed in the 18th century? What secrets and mysteries were they seeking? The knowledge of these secrets was so important that even if someone knew about them, they couldn't tell anyone except the secret chancellery. They were not allowed to be questioned. This was strictly enforced. There are very interesting memoirs of Banka Kain. 
There is a historian, named Mordatze. He briefly recorded his memoirs, and they have never been published. Vanka Kine was the master of Moscow in the 18th century. There was no authority in Moscow. In the city of Moscow in the 18th century, there was no Romanov authority. The chief was Vanka Kine, and Moscow was under his rule. For how many years? 10 to 20, I don't remember exactly. Mordovtsev has very interesting memoirs. He wrote about it, you should read it. The authority was established later, at the end of the 18th century. Before that, there was no administrative authority. In reality, in this war between Tobols and St. Petersburg, Turkey also participated on the side of Tobols. And perhaps France also provided some assistance to Tobols. At least on the maps of that time, France, Turkey, and Moscow Tartary are depicted in the same color for some reason. The involvement of France is an interesting and quite obscure question for us at the moment. But Turkey knowingly and directly took part in this war. And it ended with Turkey betraying Moscow Tartary by concluding a separate peace. As a result, Turkey diverted a considerable amount of forces. Moreover, St. Petersburg was practically in a hopeless position, which can be seen, by the way, even from the history of the war with Pugachev. The commander-in-chief of the Romanov troops, General Bibikov, was there. He was a young general and died during the battle. The Romanov's historians presented it in such a way that he simply fell ill, took to his bed, and died. That is, a young general, the commander-in-chief dies from an illness, just falls ill during the military operations. That's how they presented it. In reality, there was panic in St. Petersburg. The backstab delivered by Turkey, concluding a separate peace, certainly provided significant assistance. Immediately, troops under the leadership of Suvorov were withdrawn and transferred to the Eastern Front. And they emerged victorious, using very brutal methods. The population was mostly on the side of Tobols. What did they do? They disguised themselves as Tabal soldiers, as if being part of Tabal's forces, and entered a village. If the village provided them with assistance, then Romanov's troops would come afterwards and brutally massacre everyone. They made sure the people's blood ran cold, and they feared the Tabal's forces like plague. The Tabal's forces were relatively relaxed. They fought in their traditional ways. They didn't engage in atrocities, but these ones did. This is the scene of torture, hanging, and extermination of the population. After the victory over Pugachev, there was a terrible massacre along the Volga and to the east. They proceeded eastward, slaughtering and blood spilling. They even intended to sail to America but stopped. The main part of North America also belonged to Moscow Tartary. There were overseas lands of Moscow Tartary. At that time, the United States of America did not exist yet. The United States of America formed after Pugachev. Prior to that, there were some dwarf states on the eastern coast of North America. They moved westward and colonized the entire North America, abandoned lands, precisely after Pugachev's events. And afterward, Russia sold Oregon and Alaska. In other words, St. Petersburg simply couldn't hold onto these lands, couldn't orchestrate a massacre, and therefore sold them. It sold them for some laughable sum of money. And what do we see in Siberia? Today, numerous settlements are found there, including the famous Arkhaim. 
a round Cossack village. What do historians say? Some millennia before the common era. They excavate it with a smart look. They say, it turns out, in ancient times, they already had sewage systems. How advanced they were in ancient times. They create all kinds of models. These are all eradicated settlements, eradicated Cossack villages after Pugachev's war. Here are the maps showing the alleged ancient settlements around Magnitogorsk. All of them are destroyed towns, destroyed settlements, destroyed Cossack villages. They were completely annihilated. In our next program, we will continue the conversation with Gleb Vladimirovich Nosovsky about the confrontation between the Russian Empire of the Romanovs and Moscow Tartary. Watch our channel and visit the Multimedia Museum of the New Chronology in Yaroslavl. Until next time.